Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Logan Larson, Mike Akins, Norm Fazekas, and three brand new patrons, Brandon, Tech Dino, and Dane. Yay! And get that new patron feeling by joining us at patreon.com slash DTNS. On this episode, do we want the Ultralight Copilot Plus laptops to play games? Why, you probably don't need to worry about the YubiKey vulnerability and bad news for NVIDIA. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 4th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friends, welcome to the best day in the world. It's the day that we get to talk tech news with you. Let's start with the quick hits. Anthropic announced Claude Enterprise, a subscription for companies that offers proprietary company knowledge for analysis, can also get questions answered, creates graphics and simple web pages, and acts as a company-specific AI assistant. The context window on Enterprise is 500,000 tokens, meaning that Anthropic's models can process up to 200,000 lines of code, dozens of 100-page documents, or a two-hour audio transcript in a single prompt. There are other similar offerings. OpenAI offers one of them. No word on the price yet for from Anthropic, but the company tells TechCrunch it will be more expensive than its $30 team plan. Social media company X is trying to boost ad revenue, announced a new TV app available on app stores to court advertisers, creators, and partners around a video-first version of the platform. X plans to introduce new video tab on its own platform as well. TechCrunch notes that some users can see a beta of the TV app in Amazon Fire TV and Google TV. Microsoft will make an announcement live streaming on LinkedIn at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, September 16th, called Wave 2 to talk about the next phase for Copilot. Later in the month, on September 26th, Microsoft will offer the Surface Pro 10 and Surface Pro Copilot Plus, both with 5G for business customers. And in November, laptops running qualifying chips from Intel and AMD can join Qualcomm-powered laptops in getting Copilot Plus features through a software update as well. Ubisoft's two recent releases, including the long-awaited Star Wars Outlaws and Free-to-Play X Defiant, didn't get as warm of a reception as folks hoped for. Chief Financial Officer Frederick Duge said in July, the company expected Outlaws to boost net bookings in the July-September quarter after several years of game cancellations and delays. Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Shadows is still scheduled for release on November 15th. Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon X Plus, which is a more affordable alternative to the Snapdragon X Elite for laptops. You get about half the GPU power of the Elite, but you also get a cheaper laptop with the same neural processing unit power for AI. The Asus VivoBook S15 and Dell Inspiron 14 both use the chip and both sell for $899. Acer, HP, Lenovo, and Samsung all announced laptops with the Snapdragon X Plus. All right, so we don't always cover stock market volatility. Uh, in fact, we really try to make sure if we do, it means something to you. This one's pretty significant, though. NVIDIA shares fell Tuesday in the deepest ever single-day decline in market value for a U.S. company. Historically, a historic drop losing $279 billion in market cap. Last week, we told you that NVIDIA's forecast for the current quarter that we're in right now was lower than what analysts had expected, signaling a, a cool off in AI investment kind of had to happen. Uh, NVIDIA has been you know, top dog for, for quite a while. But NVIDIA has other not so great news. Bloomberg reports that the U.S. Department of Justice has issued legally binding subpoenas to NVIDIA and a smattering of other third party companies that work with NVIDIA as part of an ongoing antitrust investigation into whether, uh, whether NVIDIA's dominance in the AI processor market is leading to anti competitive practices. Not a formal complaint. That might come later. This is not that yet. It does show, though, that the DOJ is serious about figuring out and perhaps fining NVIDIA or worse about limiting competition by making it harder for customers to switch to a other AI processors. Also, the department is examining whether NVIDIA charged higher prices for its networking equipment 
two customers who chose AI processors from AMD and Intel. Yeah, and they're also right. being investigated in France. So, you know, and uh, NVIDIA may have lost a lot of value, but they're still big enough to be under investigation. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Just goes to show you how well NVIDIA has been doing. Yeah, I mean, that that loss is... You know, if you've got NVIDIA stock, this is something that you would care about. Many other people sort of say, all right, well, what does it mean for us? You know, a lot of that is, uh, I, you know, I think, I think there are many factors here. I mean, one of them being NVIDIA is, is definitely a company that uh, was providing uh, AI chips, you know, you know, the GPU shortage of the pandemic. I mean, all of that stuff was specifically NVIDIA, and now it's, well, NVIDIA and other companies. I mean, that, that's how competition works. So I think that NVIDIA could could never really, you know, the stock rally was, was never really going to last that long. But if it is anti-competitive, then the company has a host of other problems. Yes, yeah, interesting, right? Because prior to their meteoric rise in AI chip dominance, it was all GPUs and and the traditional NVIDIA, Nvidia that we all have known for decades, and they were cooking along, doing just fine. Everybody looked forward to the next GPUs, that sort of thing. AI chips come, they start making bank, and that kind of rocket to the top stock price and just notoriety in an industry always means that at some point you're going to have to correct. You're going to hit a ceiling and go, Err. and I feel like this is just it. And it seems massive and significant because, number one, it is. But also, it makes sense. You know, you weren't going to ride that that lightning forever, I don't think. And um, my guess is it'll settle down and then kind of climb up again. It's probably not going to keep going down. Yeah, I mean, my the way that I read this is less about like, oh, NVIDIA's stock just tanked. You know, it's totally in the toilet. More of it was so overvalued and now it came back down. Yeah, it happened in a relatively short period of time. So it gets a lot of attention for that. But this didn't. This did not seem sustainable to me. This is this is really not that much about competition I mean, from where I see it either. There's there's not a whole lot of folks who are threatening Nvidia. In fact, Nvidia can't make enough chips to satisfy its demand. It's more complex than just Nvidia was overvalued too. Nvidia was overvalued because I think a lot of people are starting to cool on AI in general. They're thinking, well, maybe the Nvidia won't be able to sell as many chips as we thought. But I also think think there's just a wider economic downturn going on. There's there's a a worry about uh, the fact that inflation is not cooling as fast as people thought. There was a general sell off this week, not just around Nvidia. So. It, there's a lot more factoring into this, which cause a record-setting one-day drop, uh, and it's more of a financial story than than it is uh, a tech story. Going back to what you were saying, Sarah, what this means for you is maybe there's a little less enthusiasm for AI out there. Uh, if if you're a consumer, you might see fewer products being marketed, uh, and that may be a good thing because maybe only the good ones uh, come to market now, and you see fewer of the ones where you're like, hold on, why do I want that AI pin? Uh, but we'll see about that. I think the bigger news here is the antitrust investigation. I think the fact that we are getting subpoenas means the Department of Justice thinks they're going to bring a case. Now, that could still change based on what they find out uh, after the subpoenas, but you, you issue the subpoenas because you want to get this stuff on the record you want people to be legally bound to tell you what they know. Uh, yeah, you're and taking it, it seriously. Yeah, it, and it means you are you are collecting things to file a former a formal lawsuit. So uh, I don't know I I don't know that I could guess when the DOJ would file that, but it sounds like they're convinced that they can do it. It's interesting too that um, this is this is a lot like her, the last time we had a gold rush in this business. And the last time that really sticks out to me anyway, I mean, there have been many little little ones, but the original sort of web push around 2000, before the bubble popped, there was just such a rush to everybody's got to have a website, everybody's got to have a presence, let's spend all our money on, on uh, ads on the Super Bowl, all this sort of stuff. And then there was this big collective, bleh, everybody had to cool off for a minute. I feel like we're doing that. You know, how many wearables? Are you wearables? equating NVIDIA to Pets.com? I that, am. I is actually that what you're am. Right now? I am, except there is one clear difference, right? <laughs> NVIDIA's all right. They're fine. They're going to be fine. Yeah. They, they, they were already there. They'll continue to already be there. And I think, again, this is just a correction that pulls back a little bit and they keep going. And I think, I, at least I hope we learn some things from the dot-com bubble. 
But it feels like that again, where everybody's going, ah, and yeah. then sometimes you have to go, no, take a step back two steps, and then let's try again. Kind I of think thing. you're right. I, I think, think the complicating think... factor is the wider economic downturn, though. I think that is accentuating what would be probably a, a market correction no matter what. Yeah. I think um, if the DOJ does find NVIDIA to have uh, sold networking equipment to at a higher price to customers who chose chips other than NVIDIA's own chips, I would love to see the company try to explain why that made sense. Oh, you, easy. easy. Uh, you, 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 when you buy something at Costco, you pay less per chip for the huge bag of tortilla chips, right? Uh, what NVIDIA needs to demonstrate is, yeah, we, cho we, we charged people more when they didn't buy others of our products for exactly that reason. Like, it's not illegal to give someone a discount because they're doing more business with you. Uh, and, and so the no. question is, was yeah. that all they were doing? Or right. were they price fixing? Were they were they abusing that privilege uh, to drive up prices? And that that's what the DOJ is trying to determine there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I'm you know I, like this one thing that won't change is like, hey, Nvidia, where's my new GPUs? We're all there is a subset small market that is still just waiting for the next good GPU. I'm one of them. It's like, when's the 5090 series? When's this going to happen? When's that going to happen? And uh, when those days come, we're all going to be super stoked, and we won't even be thinking about their AI chip downturn. But, you know, they'll be fine. NVIDIA's yeah. good. Uh, what is not good is that there's a vulnerability in the YubiKey. Uh, the YubiKey is a physical key, uh, a secure physical key you can use as a second factor. That That's a big advantage uh, over even an app because... You hold on to the key, and as long as you have the key, no one else has your second factor. You know exactly where it is. Don't lose the key, uh, you know, and there's ways to have backups and all that. But but it is a very secure physical uh, key. It has very good encryption on it. But researchers at Ninja Lab have discovered how to conduct a side channel attack in the microcontroller on YubiKey. This side channel attack theoretically could happen in other things like card keys and other kinds of keys that use that same kind of microcontroller, but they demonstrated it on the YubiKey. Uh, it would allow an attacker to clone your key. Uh, so in other words, you know, you wouldn't know that they did it Theoretically, they could get a hold of your key, clone it, get it back to you. Maybe you never know they took it, and then they have your second factor. This only applies to YubiKeys older than May. If you've gotten your YubiKey brand new since May, it should be fine. You should go double check to make sure, but uh, the firmware makes the difference. And I'll get into that in a second. The attacker also has to be very sophisticated, probably backed by a nation state, and you have to be a high value target worth cloning, and they have to have the time to do the cloning with your key without you knowing it. Uh, the estimate is it's about $11,000 worth of equipment to do the cloning. So this is not something people are going to be doing on the street. You also have to have the target's login and password. It's not enough just to clone the key. You also have to get their login and password, not just to get into their account, but to do the cloning. In other words, you have to have their login and password before you clone their key. And you have to open their key and access the logic board. It is a somewhat intricate process. You then have to connect it to your own hardware and software to be able to do the cloning. This takes a little bit of time. Uh, theoretically, if somebody left their key in their hotel room and you got into their hotel room, you might have enough time to do it. But it's not something you're going to you know, do in passing while you're standing next to them in line at the theater. <laughs> yeah, but besides tackling the person and being like, I'm doing this. I'm yeah. Then, then they'll know that, they're, that you're cloning their keys. So it's not very surreptitious. Uh, what I'm saying is you probably don't need to worry about this. Uh, I, you're a very valuable person, but I don't think you're the kind of high value target uh, that someone would be after. This is also just being done by researchers. It's not something that's being done in the wild. And if you are very sure that you are a high value target that a nation state would be after, there are mitigations you can do to avoid this. Uh, you can protect the key with a fingerprint or a pin. Uh, that is not ironclad. There might still be a way to do this cloning, but it would make it even more difficult. But the best mitigation 
uh, is to know that the vulnerability only exists in YubiKey firmware prior to 5.7. It's a type of, of encryption that was used on the YubiKey before version 5.7 that they were able to reverse engineer to do this attack. So there's not even a vulnerability in YubiKey. It's that they were able to crack that encryption. Uh, after 5.7, YubiKey is using their own encryption from within YubiKey, which is not vulnerable to this. So if you really want to be 100% certain that you're not vulnerable to this attack, uh, just deauthorize all your existing YubiKeys, buy brand new ones that, have, that you're sure have been made after May and have the 5.7 firmware, and you're good. So they don't let you update firmware, these devices. Um it's no, they're not. Weird. They're not updatable. I wouldn't right. say they don't let you. It's just they they're not built to do that. They're is that a is that, that a? I guess the reason I bring it up is that a we do we see that as a weakness? no that 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 is actually a security measure itself. Is like somebody can't like go change the firmware on your YubiKey and then mess with it. That makes sense to me. Yeah, you'd want I'm like that's kind of a do ba, a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of problem. But um, if you can't update it, you're both being protected and you are vulnerable to possibilities mm -hmm. like this. I suppose. Yeah. Although not that I, vulnerable based on your description. It sounds like it's this is easily avoidable. Yeah, I mean, worried. you have to have a lot of expensive equipment, a lot of time, already know someone's password and, and log in. Like it, this, this is a lot of time and money you have to invest to be able to clone their YubiKey just to get into that account. That better be a valuable account. You're not doing this to get into somebody's Spotify to see their playlists or anything. <laughs> no. I pulled a few folks uh, earlier today um, that I know have YubiKeys uh, and... I said, all right, so wh what do you think? And the initial reaction was like, what? Well, I mean, you know, we, this is, this is yeah, I can't believe it. We should at least get free new ones, you know, <laughs> I, out, I, you know, out of control. And I was like, but are you, you know, like I'm not saying that you're not an important person, right? <laughs> because the implication here is that if somebody has information that simply must must be gotten from somebody else, then maybe you would go through this process. Otherwise, yeah. it's kind of far fetched. If and, I, if you I know, could, like, so, mm -hmm. no, I was going to say, if I could put it in context, the YubiKey with this vulnerability is still more secure than using an authenticator app on your phone. Yeah, that's an there important distinction yeah. to make. But also, you know, it would be really cool thing for the company to do. I'm not saying they have to, I'm not saying I accept it or I expect it. But if they said, hey, we'll give you 20% off if you're somebody who bought it before May, it would go a long way to have people calm down, I think. I guess. I don't know. To, I, I, guess. I think you're right. That would be a nice thing for them to do, and maybe it would increase sales. So maybe it's a smart thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I personally, as a YubiKey user, do not feel like this is their fault. Uh, researchers reverse engineered the Infineon encryption scheme. That's that's not that's not something YubiKey f dropped the ball on. That's like, hey, we broke this encryption scheme, and YubiKey had already moved on from it. Uh, and so the 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 fact that it is still more secure to use that 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 encryption scheme on that key uh, than it is to use other kinds of second factors. Certainly, way more secure than using SMS as your second factor uh, means like I I don't personally expect anything from YubiKey, but you know your mileage may vary. Mm. Let us know if your mileage varies. Let us know what your miles per gallon and your fuel efficiency are in our Discord, <laughs> which you can join by linking to a Patreon Not account. Not enough. <laughs> Patreon.com slash DTNS. I want to see them. Discord, tell me your fuel efficiency right now. Back in June, Microsoft Copilot Plus PCs began arriving on Qualcomm's Snapdragon X Elite chips. Well, not on the chips, on devices that had the chips in them. Uh, these are ARM-based chips, not x86, which means many programs written for x86 on Windows have to run in an emulation layer if you want to run them. That means a lot of video games can technically run, even though they're x86 games. But not a lot of them. The Wall Street Journal uh, was among many outlets noting that video games don't seem to be running well <laughs> on these systems, uh, except for things like Baldur's Gate that have been made native for them. Uh, James McWhorter is an analyst uh, who noted that about 1,300 games have been independently tested to see if they work on Qualcomm-powered PCs, and about half of them <laughs> do. Uh, one of the problems is that even if you get the actual... Um, 
game running well in emulation. There's anti-cheat software on a lot of this stuff. Fortnite is a big example of that. That caused problems because the anti-cheat software sometimes recognizes the emulation layer as a cheat and then stops it from running. Uh, Qualcomm says it's working with Epic specifically on, on that with Fortnite. Um, but Qualcomm also says the Snapdragon X Elite uh, is not considered a gaming platform. So if you want Copilot Plus features like real-time subtitles on video or image generation in paint, for example, uh, but you also want to play games, Intel has an answer for you. Uh, at IFA, they have launched the Intel Core Ultra 200V series. You may have heard us talk about it before as Lunar Lake. The first laptops with Ultra 200V will arrive September 24th from all the US usual suspects, Asus, Samsung, HP, etc. Uh, Intel promises 68% better frame rates than the top shelf Qualcomm X1E 84100. Uh, so the, the GPU that runs with the Snapdragon X Elite, uh, they have that in the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Edge, for example. Uh, Intel also says it's 16% better frame rates than AMD's HX 370, which is in the Asus ZenBook S16. The trade-off is you're limited to 32 gigabytes of RAM max and eight CPU cores, eight threads, and eight GPU cores. Now, Scott, the premise I see in a lot of the reporting around this is these people are getting these ultralight laptops, and it's the only way to get these new Copilot Plus features, which are coming to some of them in November and on the Qualcomm ones right now, but yet they can't play their video games on them. But if they want to play video games on their desktop, they can't get the Copilot Plus features because those are only available on these ultralight laptops. What are we to do? Oh, it's such a <laughs> twisted world we weave here. Um, it's interesting. It reminds me immediately of some of the problems, although not nearly 50% like they're seeing with the Qualcomm chips. But on the Steam Deck, uh, they use a Zen 2, or excuse me, yeah, Zen 2 from AMD. And... It's the translation layer, Proton, that is the the heavy lifter here. It does a really good job of emulating Windows games where there is no Windows version of the game and does so pretty deftly, kind of across the board. Now, it's not every game. There are definitely ones that don't work, but there are a ton, way more than 50%. So I actually think this is solvable through that translation layer over time. Uh, it's clearly not perfect at launch or ready for these devices now, but I think over time that will get better. Um, so I'm actually not too worried about that. I, th I think that's still a solid place to go. Uh, as far as uh, what these chips are capable of on the AI side, and that includes the new Copilot CPUs from Intel, whether they're a a x86 based or whether they're ARM based, it kind of doesn't matter because you've got you're going to have friends who have a just jacked, awesome, amazing desktop computer with the latest GPU pumping out insane teraflops every single day. And they're going to be wondering, scratching their head, going, how come I can't do the AI stuff you and your little thin notebook can do? And the little thin notebook people are going to say, well, if I can do all this amazing AI stuff, how come I can't run Unreal Tournament 2003 anymore or whatever it is yeah, that, right. that they're trying to play? And I think that that's going to be an interesting juxtaposition for a little while. But I do think in the long run, like I said, with Qualcomm and and a lot of the uh, these, these chips, like the M1 uh, through M4 chips on Apple's side, same kind of thing. Like they run some games beautifully, like incredibly, and some of them run terrible. Um, I think you're going to start to see a little more equity on that level as the translation layer gets better and better. Most people who buy a Steam Deck, they don't even know that's happening. It just yeah. works. They're just playing. I mean, and granted, and that is x86 to x86. It's an operation system translation layer, but still translating. Still yeah. has to do add overhead to it. Right? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, in the in the Steam Deck case, it's actually an ARM chip. And it is doing that translation through Proton. I'm not saying that Proton should be the answer to everything, but Proton works pretty dang well. They've worked on that for a long time. Uh, maybe we give too much credit to Valve, but maybe they could share a little bit. It is based on some open source stuff, so probably could fork it and do it. But um, I, I think the future is bright on both sides. It's just easy to get confused as a consumer and say, well, I got all this power on my desktop. Why can't I do these AI things? It's like, what's so fancy about your paper thin notebook? Well, it's all in the chip. And yeah. that's it. And people, I think we're just going to have to get more literacy around that and understand it. So you know what you're buying and you know what your output's going to be and what you're going to get. For the meantime, you're going to be able to play some good games, maybe not all games, at least 50% of the ones tested are going to run fine and, you, and you'll be okay, at least in the Qualcomm case. In the, in the, uh, in the x86 case, you're going to have a lot better luck, but you're still not going to get 
the kind of power you'd get out of a 4090 or some, you know, fancy GPU that cost you $1,500. So I don't know. Those expectations are going to have to be a little bit reset, I think, in the minds of some some players and just some productivity users so they understand. Yeah. And, you know, it does show the interesting weirdness of ARM leading the way mm -hmm. by having the efficient instruction set that lets you do the MPU at 50 or 45 tops. Uh, and Intel and AMD are like, well, we want to shove into the ultralight space, so we'll put that in our NPUs on the ultralight space first. Uh, but yeah, eventually all the chips are going to be able to work at that. And it feels like level. early days. That's the other thing. This is all yeah. like we were talking earlier about NVIDIA's up and down on their, their stock. It's, this is just like a time for figuring things out. And we should look at it excitedly. I'm I'm stoked to see the directions this all takes. So we new new adventures, everybody, in tech. <laughs> adventures in tech. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag to see what other adventures we have. Uh, Derek wrote in uh, about our conversation yesterday about uh, is is your phone's uh, microphone listening in on you, etc. Derek says, wanted to reaffirm yesterday's discussion that there's no targeting based on audio conversations from your phone, at least not with any of the big reputable, at, at, reputable advertising companies. I mean, sure, your cable companies selling your data, credit score companies, even if you never signed with them, are selling your data. Heck, even supermarkets have gotten into the data and advertising game, although all of this is not supposed to include any personal identifiable by identifiable viable information. So while you shouldn't worry yet about your phone listening in on you, rest assured that everything else out there probably is selling your data. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Derek works in the advertising industry, a uh, friend of the show, known him for a long time. Uh, so he, I, I'll vouch for his knowledge of the advertising industry here for everyone. And I just think it is funny that he was like, your phone is not listening to you and then serving you ads. But they know lots about you. If you want to worry about something, don't worry about the microphone. Worry about all right. these other things that he mentioned. Yeah, like if it inspires outrage, well, there might be some things to be outraged about. I know. It's the other night. I could tell you this quick thing. We watched the first two Alien movies, and my wife the next day said, why are all my social feeds and everything talking about aliens all of a sudden? Do they listen to us watch movies? And I said... No, but they do track that you went to an app, watched a thing, looked it up, searched yep. for it, clicked it, and that translates over <laughs> here, and now you're seeing. I had to kind of explain it, but a lot of people yeah. just think your phone's just straight up listening to all that. What, well, one of the and great I think ones, it's, it's easy to to forget, too. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, they heard us. It's like, yeah. well, no, we watched it. Yeah. yeah. That was tracked. They know we watched it. They don't have to be listening to know that. Mm. And, I, and I like to point out to people, like, have you ever said, man, my uh, all my advertisements were for a thing I've never heard of? No, because you ignore those. But yeah. it's, it's the stopped clock phenomenon sometimes where it's like they're always throwing something that they think you might have done recently. You only notice when they're right. Yep. I think you're right. Uh, we also have an email from Rodney who says on DTNS 4846, you spoke about mind sift and Instagram listening to apps. I had an experience in the spring where I was listening to This Week in Tech on iOS using Downcast and the car technology reporter mentioned a new BMW scooter. About an hour later, I remarked to my wife, that's creepy. I just got an ad on Instagram for the exact model of scooter that was mentioned on Twit. Now I can understand how things you do can cause ads to appear, but I have no use for a scooter, nor did I want to search for one. So unexpected it was. However, in another test, I have randomly been mentioning turtle wax around the tube lady with no success, as I have not received ads nor a lifetime supply. Rodney. Well, so and it Rodney. sounds like Rodney <laughs> is one of those examples of like the scooter thing was just coincidental and weird and eerie. Yeah. Yeah. But trying to get ads for something didn't uh, elicit any results. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Rodney. That's a great, great example of that. Yeah, thanks to everybody who writes us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where you can send your thoughts and comments. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, as well. Let folks know what is going on in your world. Well, uh, good news is this. If you like gaming talk and specifically discussions around the broader part of the industry, I have a show called Core that airs on Thursdays. And tomorrow night we're going to talk about um, kind of a big mess happening on the Sony side of things. They released a game, and then three days later... They unreleased it and gave everybody refunds, 
We're going to talk about what happened with Concord, why it got pulled, and what players are doing right now to hurry up and take advantage of the achievement system before it all goes down. Uh, so check that out. It's over at frogpants.com slash core, or you can search for core wherever you get your shows. And if you're a patron of DTNS, you want a little sneak peek at thoughts from Scott Johnson about Concord. Uh, we're going to talk to him about that and Star Wars Outlaws. So stick around for good day internet. That's only for patrons, though. All the rest of you, the show's about to end. <laughs> for those of you who are saying goodbye to us just a reminder we do do the show live Monday through Friday at 4pm Eastern that is 2000 UTC you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live and if you're not a patron become a patron it's so much better we'll be back tomorrow talking Android 15 it's rolling out and Ron Richards from Android Faithful is joining us talk to you then the DTNS family of podcasts helping each other Understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>